How many uh, things like this do you think are actually in practical use today? Briquetting is, is worldwide. worldwide. Uh, briquetting is all over uh, Africa, uh, South America, China, Korea. It's used here in the United States, mm. out west in Indian reservations. Mm. The source of, of burning fuel is limited in a lot of areas but you have a lot of decayed vegetation sure. that you can make biomass out of. So if we just teach them how to make this so it binds together. We did develop a small press here in Cincinnati. There's a very large press that you can use that takes a lot of people to run it. Mm -hmm. We put together a small press, and the way this material is made is you have a perforated base plate, and this is just 3-inch PVC, uh, pretty much accessible around the world. Some places it's a little bit expensive. With a center drainage tube, and you fill this with this wet, mushy, biomass in here and a plunger and then on one of the presses either large press or small press and it takes a lot of pressure do you want to get all those fibers bound together mm -hmm. take it out you push it out of the press and you wind up with something like this put it in the sun and in Ohio sun it will dry in oh, easily a couple days somewhere in Africa it will take three days or so because of their altitude and this is small. This is for a, a small family. What a family can do at a family setting. Sure. We have a very large press that will take six or eight people to run. The other interesting thing is all of a sudden you have a method of producing economy. Mm. They don't have any products to sell. Mm. Well, guess what? If they can make briquettes, it's, it's a needed item. A small little village can make briquettes and sell them for a penny a piece, two pennies, whatever they're, they can start making their own money. Absolutely. And it's terrific. They absolutely love it. I'm bad. You know? Cool. One of the issues is you don't go into a developing country and tell them how to do things. That, we all know, doesn't work. Right. We'll develop the technology and then find people that can understand it locally and integrate it locally their own way. You know, our ideas are not always the best idea. And an example is refrigeration. We talked about cooking and the fuel. How do you preserve food? For example, if you grow spinach, Spinach will go bad. Once you pick it, it will go bad in about a day. But if you're going to market and you're selling spinach and you have to travel over a long, uh, rough terrain, you have to come back and do that every day. Well, how about a way to preserve that and preserve uh, your vegetables? There's a lot of vegetable usage there. Is a gentleman in Nigeria, uh, again, not in the United States, but it was a, a gentleman in a university situation, uh, developed what we call a pot cooler. It's a pot and a pot cooler. And this is it here. Very simply, it's two ceramic pots, uh, this ceramic pot here, and we have the hole in this one plugged up. And ceramic clay pot, as you know, is porous. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll, it'll leach water through sure, it. Sure, sure. And what you do is you fill this with sand to the point to where this pot is just sitting in there like that. And all this area is filled with sand. You then fill that with water and wet the sand all the way up to here. Put your vegetables, what you're going to store in there. Then you cover it, excuse me, with a uh, wet towel on top uh, like that. Just take a wet towel and throw it over the top. In 100 degree temperature, you can easily have that inside temperature in the low 70s. Get a 30 degree wow. amount of cooling. Wow. Uh, at lower temperatures, you'll get 15, 20 degrees of cooling. It's a significant amount of cooling. Absolutely. And it's absolutely low technology. Yeah, it it's sure two is. clay pots, a towel, <laughs> and some sand. It's another example of how you can take an engineering solution and, and make it low cost, make it free. They have very good industries of making clay pots. I mean, it's it's a tech, it's been around society and sure. civilizations forever. And we're not so sure that this wasn't used thousands of years ago. We just don't know that, you know. Right, it right. was just rediscovered these <laughs> days. So that's a good example of uh, another application of applying and, it. And this is all stuff that basically we, uh, we uh, try to find a place to dump it. <laughs> exactly. This is all waste material. Right. right. The banana trees, for example, that we're working on in a group in Rwanda just lay, they lay at the base and another sprout banana tree comes up. They get another hand of bananas, mm. cut it down with a machete, and lay it there. And so we want to start using that. Now, you had mentioned uh, off camera that uh, you're not traveling, but you, the uh, people that you partner with, like the university, right. do they travel to these places uh, and uh, try to instill this knowledge upon on the people? They do, Eric. Uh, uh, there, we have a couple of traveling groups here in Cincinnati. We, we partner with the University of Cincinnati. They have their own uh, development activities and their own group that will travel to their community and it may not be Africa they may pick a, a community in Brazil or, or sure. someplace like that and do their traveling in our case we have a traveling team of engineers they're different age groups we have a, a young lady the civil engineer Johanna 
that is part of the traveling team, and then uh, uh, some older uh, fellows on the team, uh, typically four, we will send over. We do a number of things while we're on, on the ground. Here we'll say boots on the ground, over there they say sandals on the soil. But you're doing two things. You're implementing this year's work. We'll spend this year working on something and then go over there and implement it. And at the same time, they're doing an assessment. What are they doing? How are they coming along? How's what the projects we did last year, two years ago, are they still implemented? Are they still functional? Uh, water's a big deal. Mm. We took water from a spring almost two miles away and got it into this orphanage that we take care of. And there's issues in maintaining that, that line. So it's an ongoing activity of assessing past work, assessing what we're going to do next year, and then implementing what we've what we've designed. So it's an active group. They go over there for about three weeks. We'll get a lot done in that period of time. Can you think of any of the groups? I mean, you, you've gone over, you've helped. Uh, now, are they able to keep that going on their own, or do they require our assistance? Uh, the, uh, the goal is to teach them to do it themselves. Right. Years ago, when, when EWB first started, they would go over and do the project and quickly realize that's not the way to do it. In fact, we're very much looking for other than engineers in our group, we're looking for sociologists, psychologists, healthcare workers, other people, because we have to address all the issues. And this, there's a big cultural issue here. So interesting enough, just getting them to maintain something turns out to be a big issue. We're used to maintaining things here in this country. They're not, because they never had it to start with. Right. So they don't know about the maintenance. So right. we put in a water system. This year we just put in a, a water catchment system. Off, we catch the, the water off the roofs. And, take, and put it in a great big tank. You have to learn to maintain that. And so that's part of that whole thing. And we're pleased. You go back now and things are still working. You had mentioned that, uh, you know, 90% of the world uh, is, uh, you know, basically doesn't have all the nice things that we have uh, in, the, in this country. Right. Um, how do you decide what countries that you want to go to? I mean, obviously you've got a big pool there to generate from. How do you decide where to go? I mean, The national chapter of EWB, we have a lot of guidelines and a lot of rules. We just, we just don't go over to a country. Our village in Rwanda here is because the largest population of Rwanda immigrants is in the Dayton, Cincinnati area. Okay. So we have a lot of native Rwanda people here locally. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense that we would deal with that country or a village in that country. And, and a lot of the decisions are made that way. Okay. Uh, but it's got to get cleared through the nationals and through the political channels. There's a lot of political issues in going into a, a, a a jurisdiction that where the political structure is very our particular area there was an enormous amount of genocide over 15 percent of the population are orphans mm. so some of the areas that we're, we're supporting are orphanages and you'll have two to three hundred uh, children in the orphanage 200 of them sleeping overnight they don't have a home to go to. These issues of food, water, cooking, and food preservation, big issues. If people want to know more about your organization, is there a website, uh, we phone have a, numbers? Absolutely. Uh, uh, we have a local chapter. The Engineers Without Borders Greater Cincinnati Professional Chapter has a website. It's EWBGCP, Greater Cincinnati Professional, EWBGCP.org. And there's a, a second website where we have a lot of engineering material on uh, that uh, can be put on the, on the screen here. Get more information on how to join the local chapter, we meet at the Pleasant Ridge Library uh, once a month. We have two meetings. We have a general meeting and we have an engineering meeting once a month to keep uh, active control of the projects. Great, mm -hmm. great. Fantastic. It is. So it, I, it's an absolute blast. I yep. appreciate you coming on and explaining to us, and uh, hopefully uh, it, it'll just continue to grow. You bet. And be a viable thing. Well, thank you for asking me. You bet.